So the, the first part is this just fascinating archaeological dig into your career in stand-up. Had you looked through, there are these tapes and notebooks, even a diary from 1975. Well, I knew that existed because I used it when I wrote my autobiography, when you used the perfect word, archaeological, because I had all this stuff. I realized I, I saved all the wrong things. You know, when you're first becoming famous, whatever, you know, you save your uh, magazine covers, and, which are meaningless, and the stories inside them are meaningless. Uh, but what I wish I'd saved were photos and friends and locations. And, but anyway, I had one box, cardboard box, that I would just throw things in. And it was a crucial time in my career, about 1975. And I could go through it like, uh, you know, sediment. It was laid down. Like at the bottom was older and in the middle was the Middle Ages <laughs> and then at the top. So I could locate, I had like hotel receipts from Utah. And I go, oh, here I was on that date. I was in Utah. And then I also uh, was able to um, contact people who were relevant to my early, early career. I mean, I found the doorman at the Coffee and Confusion, and he remembered stories. I went, oh, yeah. So he jogged my mind. Steve actually saved more than he thinks he saved. I mean, you well, had, no, yeah. I, you know, I, I did, one of the things I got out of this was a, uh, you know, 11 terabyte hard drive <laughs> with everything digitized. That's and precious. I didn't know I had all, all this yeah. stuff, you know. I think we scanned 5,000 things at your Jeez, house. Yeah. But all the audio cassettes, because you would go in your early stand-up days mm -hmm. and just leave a tape recorder going. Sometimes. Well, I would at certain times. I would, uh, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if we had those. I, I did it later, but I, I would record uh, my show like at the Troubadour on a cassette and then dutifully, I hated to do it, but listen to it back. And the one thing I learned was no drinking. Oh, really? Yeah. How did you learn that? Well, it'd be like second show. And I did a bit with, uh, you know, a glass of wine, like I was a playboy or something. And so the waitress at the Troubadour would just bring me up a glass of wine. And then I heard the tape back and it was just a little bit like that. And I never do that again. And I didn't. That's great. There is a value to even though it's painful to yeah, listen painful to that. Yeah, it's painful to listen back. And is it painful for you to listen to those old tapes now? I don't listen to them. I, it would be painful. But Morgan made you listen to some of them. Well, I had to listen on camera. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It lasted about <laughs> three minutes. <laughs> yeah, I think I said, I, I can't do this. Why? It's very hard to look back. It just, you know, because the premise is you get better. And so the further back you go, theoretically, the worse you are. And uh, I know I, I just don't need it. I, I don't know. I don't need it. You know, I, it, it comes flooding back. Oh, yeah, I remember that. I remember that line. Mm -hmm. that I took that out like a year later, and I shortened it, and, you know. Yeah, it's just you don't like it. Not for me. Like I say, you know, uh, what's uh, Gloria Swanson watching her films over and over and over? That's the opposite of, of me. <laughs> That's not you. <laughs> yeah. What was it like for you going through this material then as, as a fan who'd, who'd kind of grown up on this? Well, you know, it's interesting because once you start making a film, I don't approach it as a fan. You kind of put that away. But also, um, what I found, you know, the reason I was so excited about doing this documentary is that there's that part of Steve's story, the, the comedy story, but I've paid attention to Steve's career the whole time. So his playwriting, his novels, you know, all these different sides of Steve and of course the films. So I knew he was somebody who went in many different interesting directions. You know, very, you know, I kind of love high and low culture and Steve has done it all in between. So I knew there was gonna be a lot of interesting stuff to get into. Mike um, Nichols, sorry, Mike Nichols told me once, you always aim high and something low. <laughs> did you take that as a compliment? I did. Yeah, I knew it was right on. Yeah. I love that. Um, so at the end of the first film, not to give anything away, but the yeah. end of the first film is you're walking away from stand-up. Right. Why'd you walk away? It's such a, 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 it's a long story and it's a simple story 
is that I was exhausted by it. And I thought, wow, if I make a move, you know, when I do stand up, I have to go there. If I do a movie, I stay home and the movie goes there. And also it felt had a sense of permanence, like you could get the thing exactly right and then it would be there exactly, you know, sort of exactly right, not forever, but at least for a while. Uh, and I was just, um, I, I was exhausted. But I also was, this is more than you want to know, but I, you know, my early act was kind of conceptual and it was making fun of comedy and it was non sequiturs. And once, to me, that idea was understood by the audience as a dead end. So, I mean, I mean, in the 70s, I did no jokes. Now, with Marty Short, I only do jokes. <laughs> <laughs> but that makes a lot of sense. And you explore this in the film that the idea of your act, at least initially, was to ratchet that tension up mm -hmm. so that there wasn't that release of the punchline. You mm -hmm. wanted to keep that tension. So it's almost like when the audience got started getting the jokes, then it was no fun doing the jokes well, anymore. Well, no, no, I loved sense. it. I, believe me, I was practical. I, I, I knew things had to get laughs, but there were, was a dry spell. <laughs> and uh, also, you know, I was young and in college and being introduced to philosophy and theories and the arts and, you know, that thing that they, you know, they hammered in then as now is the same thing. Break the rules. And now I realize the rules kind of work, but... Uh, <laughs> 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 but, um, you know, I have developed my own rules uh, through the years. You know, they go, oh, my experience tells me that that's a dead end, something like that. But, but then I was just so excited to try anything and do anything. You're a young college student be being introduced to free thinkers. And so breaking the rules was part of it. Yeah, that was the noble. Uh, I mean, I, I had an agent... And I was a writer for Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour and Glenn Campbell, and uh, I don't know how I got those jobs, but um, I... Watch the documentary and you can find out. Yeah, you got the yeah. First one. Uh, so I was saying, um, and I had my, uh, an agent, and I said, I, I want to go back. I was doing stand-up. I said, I really want to pursue stand-up. And he said, stick to writing. And I thought, I got my badge. <laughs> I got the person who doesn't believe in me. That's so great, you know. Well, it's interesting you bring that up. In, in these both of the films, you talk a lot about your dad mm -hmm. and how your mm -hmm. dad never could really give you a compliment. He had a hard time until later, until later. Did that fuel you? Uh, no, but it didn't dissuade me. Uh, I just figure generation gap. Um, and also, I sort of got it because I wasn't 100% perfect. You know, if, if you uh, come off stage, you know it's, there's elements that weren't working, that are working. Uh, but then when success started to come, that was something my father could understand. You know, he could put the aesthetic judgment over here, but the success, you know, was undeniable. My mother once said to me, I was at Neiman Marcus the other day, and when they found out I was your mother, they got so excited. And I'm thinking, how'd they find out you were my mother? Because <laughs> <laughs> she told them. <laughs> was that nice to hear? Yeah, it was, you know, happy for her. And I know you, you've talked about this in, in your other works. You mm -hmm. wrote this beautiful New Yorker piece about your dad. Right. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, with this film, do you feel like it changed how you saw him or how you thought about well, it? Well, I had already changed how I saw him long, long ago. Um, you know, we had a good, good rapport as he got older. We had, I took him out for lunch every day, and he was, had a sense of humor. You know, when he died, people came to me, he goes, your father was so much fun. He was so funny and so enjoyable. 
And my response was, he was? <laughs> I never saw that. Wow. But you were able to connect. Yeah, with absolutely. Him. We, we we had a good time, and he became president. He, he guided my fan club, you know, at, at a certain point. How remarkable is that? This guy who said, "Well, you're no Charlie Chaplin," yeah. ended up guiding your so fan club. So those are all just part of being a. I don't want to say artist, but artistic, because mm -hmm. you're going to get slammed, you know. Even by your yeah. folks. Yeah. I mean, it's not an uncommon story. Although now I think parents are quite enthusiastic mm -hmm. about their children <laughs> going into show business. Near the beginning of the first film, you say, I guarantee I had no talent. Yes. None. <laughs> I stand by that. Uh, well, meaning I couldn't sing, dance, or act. And that's generally considered talent, what talent is. So, uh, I played the banjo a little. And, you know, Marty Short has a, a joke we do in our show. He says, you play the banjo, you juggle, uh, you, well, he said, you collect art. He says, but somehow you're famous. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think if you had no talent? What did you have? A love of show business. And I, you know, I was a magician, so I had a little act I could do. And, um, you know, I just liked the stage. You know, I just, I'd look at a stage and think, wow, it's like heaven up there. And, and curtains, I love curtains. They don't really have curtains anymore, <laughs> you know. Was it, was it heaven when you were on it? Was it heaven? Uh, well, there's a fantasy and there's a reality because you're, you know, the fantasy is what you're looking at and then when you're there, you have to deliver. So that was always a little anxiety, but that's, that's normal. Any, anytime you're doing something, you're gonna have a little uh, sweat hoping that it works out. Was part of it still heaven, actually being up there? Oh yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think in my book, I talk about working at the Birdcage Theater at Knott's Berry Farm and that was heaven because the pressure was so low and the audience was so generous that we, we would kill. You know, we'd think, we are the greatest entertainers who have ever lived. And then we'd go, you know, to a folk music club where the audience's sophistication and the performer's talent was so high uh, and we go, We've got a little work to do here. <laughs> I said that like Lorne. <laughs> that did sound like yeah, it. Yeah. But in the in the second film, mm -hmm. you make another decision to walk away. You say, "Okay, the movies are kind of tired of me, and I'm tired of the movies too. Mm -hmm. Goodbye, movies." Well, it's doing a television show is very similar to doing a movie. It's I mean I I had never done a television series before until Only Murders in the Building. And, you know, after three days, I go, oh, this is exactly like a movie. I thought they'd do like one take and then run to the next <laughs> and go, not take one more take, no, cut it in half, can you tighten it? But it's just like a movie. So my distribution has changed. And uh, I like the distribution of television where you can just tune in any time. There's not an opening weekend. Uh, just, you know, there's no how do we do. You know, it's a different kind of how do we do. I said, uh, they, they ran only murders on uh, ABC. And I said, how'd we do? And they said, we don't even measure it for a month because people tape mm -hmm. it, they delay, mm -hmm. they watch it later, they watch it a different way. So, yeah, it's, it's totally changed, different. Which I like, I like that. That was always the hardest. You know, my mother, I remember, um, I'm like, I've told this story, but uh, it was opening weekend in the 80s of some movie and you're wondering how we did. And my mother called me on the Monday and she said, uh, oh, some friends of mine went to, see, went to the movies last weekend and they couldn't get in anywhere, so they went to see yours. <laughs> did you laugh at the time? Yeah, I did. That? I thought about it later. I thought, <laughs> it's, you know, you know, Marty and I have a rule. If you go backstage after someone's performance, you only say, Oh my God, that was fantastic. Because, because that is the performer's most vulnerable moment.
you know. And by the way, usually they are good, so it's not So a it's lie. easy to say. Yeah. But, but your mother said the opposite of that. They she didn't realize. She didn't know. She thought, she says, they went, she, did she follow, she said that she went to see yours and they loved it. She followed it. With okay, that. yeah, that's yeah. good. That's good. But joke's better without it. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of those vulnerable moments, you chose to put a lot of the vulnerable moments, a lot of the, mm -hmm. let's say, failures mm -hmm. in this film. Why, why focus on those? Because we learn from failure. You know, I think... How much failure is in there? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> too much, apparently. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> but... Not too late. <laughs> but part of it is, you know, what is a failure at the time doesn't necessarily make it a failure in a life. So a film like Pennies from Heaven, which was your second film mm -hmm. after The Jerk, and which was a dramatic role, and a film that was widely perceived to be a bomb, I guess, mm -hmm, at the yeah, time. Mm -hmm. Now is a film that people have totally reevaluated and love. You know, I've had many people come up to me and say, "Are you going to talk about Pennies from Heaven?" I love that film. So, I think it I was. Never, I never hear from those people. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have them call you. <laughs> yeah, okay. Have him call me. <laughs> um, but I think it's those are the things that influence the choices you make. You know, if you're just succeeding, then you're not having to work too hard to kind of navigate it. And, and it's interesting, Steve has made so many interesting choices in what he wants to do in his career. You know, and I know he's very modest about it, and I, I think you told me that, you know, you want to make 40 movies to make five good ones. I said you have to make 40 movies to get five good ones. I think he's being a little hard. <laughs> I, think the, I think the math doesn't quite add up. Well, because he's made so many that great was movies. That's my premise yeah. of making a lot of movies. Yeah. That you have to go through you quite a to, few. Yeah, you to have to make a lot of them because they're so. A movie is. You can have the greatest cast, the greatest script, the greatest thing, uh, nothing. And then you can have a movie that's pastiche together and it's a, suddenly a huge hit. Makes sense. And also, I think you make a good point that some of the movies that weren't necessarily hits back then, over time, people come to appreciate more. Well, I also, I have a, a belief. I say, you, you don't know if a movie is any good until 10 years goes by. Because you don't know what your opposite, or what's coming out at the mm -hmm. same time, you know. Mm -hmm. Because there was a math to opening weekends that if you did X amount, it starts dropping off logarithmically, no matter what. Except there's only a few films that have, like Bonnie and Clyde, I think, survived that. Mm -hmm. Had a Pauline Kael rescue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, a film like Three Amigos, you know, I think when I first talked to you about it, you said, well, it was the second biggest comedy of that weekend, and that mm -hmm. it didn't do that well. But it's a film that also has kind of grown in estimation. Over yeah, I got a years. call, I don't know, it was 10 years ago or something, and and said, uh, oh, there's a magazine in uh, England that wants to put you, uh, Chevy, and Marty on the cover. And I said, why? And they said, well, it's the 25th anniversary of Three Amigos. So I said, so? <laughs> and I didn't know that it had this, was developing a cachet. I think it's a, a movie that parents can watch with their kids, although it's not totally perfect. Not entirely <laughs> yeah. appropriate, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's all right. <laughs> Um, along those same lines of, of the tougher moments, there's this mm -hmm. one moment in there where this journalist says to you, hey, Steve, Steve, mm -hmm. one question, one question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why aren't you funny anymore? Yeah. Ah. I, that was the era of shock. And so that was, a lot of people were earning their wings by saying horrible things to people. And uh, I knew what it was at the time, I, I could tell. It was a bad moment, because I was thinking that myself. <laughs> Were you really? <laughs> sure, you know. What, why, what was that moment? Well, you go through highs and lows in your career. You know, so at any moment, y you could be thinking, it's, everything's working, everything's feeling great, and then you know, a year later, you're going, hmm, so. And when was that? I can tell you the night, I don't know the date. It was the opening of The Birdcage. 
which you would turn down. I had, I, uh, I had to turn down. I was committed to another movie. So that was another uh, aspect of it, is that I'm going to see a movie which is fantastic that I unfortunately had to turn down because I was committed to another film. And he kind of hits you at that low point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, that was his good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Why put that in? I mean, that's a mo it's so painful. Talk to him. I know, but weren't you tempted <laughs> no, it's good. to say, oh, come on, cut that out. No. That's too painful. No, I wouldn't. And I wouldn't no? do that. No? Why not? Because it's, 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 it's such a good, uh, powerful moment, well, one way or the other. You know, hate me or love me, it's a strong moment. Was that time a turning point? No. No? I, I, don't, I don't think so. I mean, I didn't react to that in, like, I'll show him. I, right, know, no, not yeah, that particular that. thing, but was, no. that, was that time? But I think right after that, I can't remember what year it was. Do you Around think? 90, 90 something? Three, but right after maybe? the year, I started writing Bowfinger which I feel is one of my yeah. best comedies. So it's like you said, it's the ebbs and flows yeah. mm -hmm. of, makes sense. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, my sense of it in looking at it is that, that there was a period around that time in the early 90s where you had done a lot of movies and then you took a bit of a hiatus mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, you know, Steve didn't make a lot of movies for a few years and I know you did a lot of work on yourself and kind mm -hmm, of tried mm -hmm. to figure a lot of things out and that's when you started writing Bowfinger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I had the idea for Bowfinger for 10 years before I started writing it. I thought, I just sat and I said, I should really write a movie. What's the best idea I have? And I went back to the premise of Bowfinger. And I agree with you about Eddie Murphy and the Oscar. Oh, he's so great. Yeah. 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 In fact, I was listening to Ed Zwick's autobiography, mm -hmm. the director. And he, he says, you know, these classic funny moments like, and he, you know, Chaplin falling in a hole and Buster Keaton getting hit by a house and, and a Bowfinger running across the freeway. Oh, yeah. I mean, he got it wrong because it wasn't Bowfinger, it was Eddie Murphy. But <laughs> still. But still, I that's thought, oh, nice well, to that's, be that's, in that up. company. It's nice, uh, you know, makes your day better. So one of the wonderful moments of the film that I could watch for hours is you and Martin Short going through jokes. Mm -hmm. How often do you do that? We do it periodically. Sometimes, you know, like um, after a tour, which like now we're gonna start Only Murders shooting, so we're not gonna be touring. So before we tour again, we'll sit down with all our collected material and the existing material and go through it. And it's fun, you know, we like each other. We have fun doing it. Was it hard for you to contain laughter yeah. watching that? It was one of my favorite shoots I've ever done because it was actually over two days them just going through joke after joke after joke and in the beginning we were doing everything we could not to laugh <laughs> and then we realized that not only that was at a fool's errand but you guys were looking for an audience you know, I think Marty even <laughs> yeah, said what's true. the matter with you <laughs> <laughs> so then we started laughing we mm -hmm. didn't have to hold mm -hmm. it in that's great what do you think it is about you know, you walked away, you stopped doing stand-up, but then you came back to stand-up when you could do it with Marty. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it, it's a slow, everything in my life is evolutionary. So I you know, stopped stand-up and, and uh, sort of wasn't really practicing the banjo. And then one day, like late 90s, I guess, Earl Scruggs called me, the greatest, world's greatest banjo player, and said, "Could you? Would you play on my 75th anniversary album, Foggy Mountain Breakdown?" And I said, "Sure." So, and I know if I could play Foggy Mountain Breakdown, I played it my whole life. So I went to the uh, uh, session, and they said, "Now here's the track you're going to play to." And it was so fast, <laughs> I thought, "Oh my God!" And so I started playing. I got through it. I said, "I'm rusty," so I started practicing and playing again. And then eventually it led to uh, a music album of some so songs I'd written. And then my agent said, so you have to go on the road. I said, what? He says, you have to go on the road to promote your album. I said, I haven't been on the road in 25 years. He said, well, that's 
that's what you got to do. Do you know a band? I said, yeah. And so now I'm on stage with a band, you know, 24 years ago, and we're starting to play. And then another friend said, you need to do humor because they're expecting you to do humor. So I said, yeah, okay. <laughs> so I slowly start working out. It's like what I did when I started out, a funny introduction to a song. It's like the Kingston Trio, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and eventually you start developing uh, routines, mm -hmm. you know, because you've got a band on stage with you. It's very different than being alone, very different. And then uh, and we toured, and I toured with Edie Brickell, and we're doing humor, and we're doing songs, and serious songs. And then when Marty, when we started developing our show, we realized what we needed to do. So it's like a two-man thing. And now I have a little 10-minute solo spot in the show that's kind of like the old days. And uh, it took literally three years to work it out. Uh, you know, when I, I, when Marty and I hosted SNL uh, last year before Christmas, and it was a hit, and it was highly rated, and, and I said to Marty afterwards, I said, Marty, I said, uh, you know, the show went well, we did good, and we could likely be asked back to host SNL, and be, we weren't, but <laughs> <laughs> I said, but before you say yes, just remember one thing. We worked on our monologue for three years. And uh, so that's, you know, it's a slow evolution. And now I'm back kind of doing this and really enjoyable. We love our jokes. Sometimes we take a joke out, say, well, we've done that quite a bit. Let's take it out. So we'll take it out for six months. We go, I missed that joke. Let's put it back. <laughs> and you put it back <laughs> yeah, in. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just that pure fun. Does, does it feel like when you were starting out, that same exhilaration? No. Oh, no, the exhilaration, uh, you know, it's just what we do. There's no, there's no panic. Which you at had this point. Initially. Yeah, I'd have that, you know. So that's nice. It's the fun yeah, without no, that, the panic. Yeah, no, you can have fun, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the sweet mm -hmm. spot. Mm-hmm.